Velkommen til Petroleumstilsynet. Kjekt å se at det er så stor interesse for dette seminaret som vi skal ha her nå. Om læring og forebygging etter Macondo. Og med presentasjon av resultatene fra RNMP, akutte utslipp. Først av alt, det viktigaste, rømningsveiene for de av dere som vet det før. Som har vært der før, så vet dere hvor det er. For de som er nye, så skal jeg fortelle dere nå. Det er ut der, eller ut der. Så samles vi ute på plassen, ut forbi her. Der er ikke planlagt noen øvelser eller annet spetakkel. Så hvis alarmen går, så er det på skikkelig. Jeg heter Øyvind Midtun. Skal prøve å lose oss gjennom disse to timene. Med anledning til masse faglige input og anledning til å spørre om det en lurer på. Her er det fullt i dag, og vi har valgt å streame dette her på internett, slik at det sitter en del ute og kikker på kontorene sine og følger med. Det betyr også at når vi åpner opp for spørsmål, så må dere vente med å snakke til dere får mikrofonen, slik at alle hører hva som blir spurt om og sagt. Da er vi klare. Jeg skal bare fortelle hva som skal skje. Først skal jeg slippe til Anne Myrvold. Hun skal ha en liten introduksjon, direktøren for Petil. Så er det klart for vår gjest fra USA, Lars Herbst, som leder en avdeling i den amerikanske sikkerhetsmyndigheten Bessi. Det er han som skal snakke om læring og forebygging etter Macron-dog. Der er det nok mye spennende å høre om. Så er det presentasjon av RNMP, akutte utslippresultatene, rapporten legges frem i dag. Etter det skal vi få høre om Statoil sitt arbeid med risikosyring og brønnindikritet og alt det som skjer der. Og så begynner vi å nærme oss slutten, men dere får ikke gå før dere har fått en liten oppsummering, signert vår fagleder for Boring og Brønn, Monika Ovesen. Det var nok fra meg. Nå er det Anne Myrvold. Og jeg skal bare si det at vi veksler litt mellom norsk og engelsk, naturlig nok, siden en av foredragsholderne ikke snakker norsk. Anne skal også få lov til å gjøre sin introduksjon på engelsk, så blir det litt sånn smooth. Vær så god, Anne. Yes, we announce twice a year a data set that gives us the information about the safety level in the Norwegian petroleum sector. We do it in April with the main results from this project and now in October with quite a lot of additional data. We will today present the data regarding acute discharges and this data set gives us an opportunity to discuss the development of the trends, and in what area it's a need to improve. Statistics and data are important to understand the risks, risk picture and to use the data. At the same time, we know and we have to remember that the data do not tell us the whole story. And we will hear more about that later when we get the presentation about the Macondo disaster. Our data of the, the uh, acute discharge point out three areas that there is a need for attention. It's well control incidents, it's subsea installation and chemical spells. I will have some remarks regarding well control incidents because we have seen situation where the risk has not been understood in the initial phase of a well control incident. Signals has, have been overlooked and not reacted to. So understanding the risk in a well operation is key. Well control events have the potential to turn into major accidents involving both serious pollution and threats to human life. So it's important that the industry works continually to prevent well control incidents. The same factors that reduce risk to people also prevent pollution. So having the right barriers 
and safety measures in place and knowing them working, that's essential. We will hear much more about the data and our, our uh, evaluation of the data later on today. We have a broad international cooperation with other authorities and regulators. We exchange experience and learnings related to incidents and accidents, and we compare regulation and audit systems to mention some. In particular, we work closely with our sister organization, BESI. BESI is the Bureau of Safety, Environmental and Enforcement in the US. And of course, one of the main topics that we have been discussing and exchanging is the learning after the Macondo disaster in 2010. So I am very happy that we have Lars Herbst here today to present their learnings. Lars is the regional director for the Gulf of Mexico Outer Continental Shelf in Bessie. He has the oversight responsibility of about 2,100 platforms and a staff of 400. I look very much forward to hear your presentation, Lars. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and again, I would like to thank Anna and, and PSA for the uh, invitation to speak with you here today. Uh, Bessie and its predecessor has had a long relationship uh, with, with PSA and its predecessor going back all the way to at least 1994. And that was with the creation of the International Regulators Forum. Uh, there's been a great amount of learnings that have been shared over those years not only between uh, U.S. and, and, and uh, PSA, or Bessie and PSA, but many of the other regulators within the International Regulators Forum. We, matter of fact, just left this week from uh, Copenhagen where we had another annual meeting and, and more learnings that were shared there. Uh, so we appreciate that relationship and that ability to learn from each other. Uh, I would say it's, it's great to be back here in Stavanger. This is maybe about my fourth trip, trip here. Uh, it's kind of amazing I can walk around my hometown of, of New Orleans and never see a statue of Lars. But uh, here, there's Lars statues <laughs> everywhere, so it's, uh, it's probably something I could get used to. So what I'd like to do is, is, is examine the learning process uh, for, for Bessie, and hopefully that will explain uh, the learnings from Macondo. So that process starts with investigation. And, so we investigate all major incidents. Uh, obviously, this was uh, the, the uh, most severe incident that uh, we've really experienced in the Gulf of Mexico. But we try to determine the causes uh, of those incidents, learn from those incidents, and try to prepare or ensure that barriers are, are put in place uh, to prevent the recurrence of, of those type incidents. Uh, these barriers are part of, <coughs> of proper risk mitigation uh, and when I talk about risk, uh, I look at it from, from both sides of the risk model, as far as the barriers that you can put in place for prevention, uh, and then the barriers you can put uh, in place to protect against those consequences or mitigate those consequences. Uh, I will try to stay fairly high level here. There's quite a bit of information, uh, and I'm always willing to, to share information uh, from our results of that investigation. So on April 20th, 2010, 11 people lost their lives uh, on the Transocean Deepwater Horizon. The following individuals lost their lives on that tragic day. Jason Christopher Anderson, Aaron Dale Burkeen, Donald Neil Clark, Stephen Ray Curtis, Gordon Lewis Jones, Roy Wyatt Kemp, Carl Dale Kleppinger, Keith Blair Manuel, Dewey Allen Rivette, Shane Michael Rashto, and Adam Taylor Weiss. You know, seeing these, these, uh, these pictures and these faces and knowing their names, that's, that's what uh, keeps me really focused as a regulator. Uh, it's, it's why I do what I do. 
uh, and we never forget what happened on that, that day. But with our investigation and the findings and the recommendations from, uh, from that investigation, we hope to improve offshore safety and prevent environmental impacts uh, by preventing recurrence of tragic events like Macondo. So if I move on with the investigation, uh, a convenient order was uh, formed a joint investigation team that was formed on April 27th of 2010. It was a joint team between Bessie uh, and the U.S. Coast Guard to identify the causal factors involved in the incident that led to the blowout uh, on the Deepwater Horizon. And again, it was to make uh, res recommendations to prevent the recurrence of, of that type of event. So for Coast Guard and their report, there were, there were uh, reports by each uh, bureau. Coast Guard was looking at fire, evacuation, search and rescue, uh, the flooding and sinking of the vessel, and safety systems related to, to personnel. On the Bessie side, what we were focused on was well design, cementing and flow path, temporary abandonment, kick detection, uh, emergency response, ignition source and explosion, uh, the BOP stack itself, and compliance with regulations and company policies. So this investigation involved seven public hearings, called over 80 witnesses, issued more than 90 subpoenas, and collected over 400,000 pages of evidence. So it seemed beforehand that everything was in place, everything was there. Uh, they had safety management system, BP had a safety management system in place. They had safe practice, uh, safe practice procedures. They had bridging documents between themselves and drilling contractors, in this case, Transocean. Uh, their record of compliance was, was fairly good uh, leading up to this. Uh, they had had 83 inspections from 2001 up to this, this point. Uh, BP was one of the uh, most experienced uh, drilling companies or operators in the Gulf of Mexico at the time. So then we asked what, what went wrong. Uh, again, 11 men died as a result of the blowout. 16 others were injured. There are estimates that Macondo Wells spilled close to 5 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico during the 87 days that it flowed. Uh, it was successfully capped on July 15th of 2010. Uh, and after months of additional intervention work, it was eventually plugged September 19th of 2010. The Bessie panel came to 56 conclusions uh, related to the incident. Uh, of course, I'm not going to cover all of those here today. I will try to, to highlight several of those in the presentation. This uh, conclusion is the overarching uh, conclusion that the blowout at Macondo Well on April 20th, 2010 was a result of a series of decisions that increased risk coupled with a number of actions that failed to fully consider or mitigate those risks. While it's not possible to discern which precise combination of these decisions and actions set the blowout in motion, it is clear that increased vigilance and awareness by BP, Transocean, and Halliburton personnel at critical junctures during the operations at Maconda Well would have reduced the likelihood of the blowout occurring. Uh, this is one of the conclusions I'd, I would like to, to highlight. This was a, a risk matrix that was uh, done in the planning of the well. Uh, in this planning, BP only placed uh, risks into three different categories. That was cost, production, and schedule. Uh, there were other risk categories available. Uh, there was health and safety. There was environment, reputation, cost, schedule, production, reserves, and net present value uh, that, that could have been uh, used to categorize some of these risks. Uh, one concern was that the BP personnel uh, in this exercise identified well control problem as a cost and not health and safety or environment as a risk. So another conclusion, BP's failure to inform the parties operating on its behalf of all known risks associated with Macondo well operations was a contributing cause of the blowout and kick detection. So uh, they knew from various reports, there was an OptiSem report, uh, for example, that showed that there was a high potential uh, for gas flow in this well and in the, in the design of the well. Uh, there were other things that were, uh, that were done as far as testing cement afterwards that showed that the cement slurry, the foam cement slurry, uh, did not meet the standards 
of API RP65, for example. Uh, so there were, there were several things that, uh, that BP, we believe, could have shared to, uh, to possibly prevent the incident. Probably most telling in, in uh, one of the conclusions is that the, uh, <clears throat> the Horizon's crew, both BP and Transocean, collectively misinterpreted a negative uh, pressure test that was the cause of the well control failure. Uh, again, here there was, there was 1,400 PSI differential between the drill pipe and the kill line, uh, and it was never really addressed. The only way it was addressed was calling it a bladder effect or annular compression. Uh, again, this was a perfect opportunity for stop work uh, that could have prevented the, the incident. Sorry. Uh, another conclusion, BP's drilling engineers failed to investigate or resolve the negative pressure test. Again, there is documentation of communication from the well site leader uh, back to BP's drilling engineer on shore uh, about this uh, difference in pressure. It was never resolved between the two, the two gentlemen. Uh, so that, again, another opportunity for someone even outside of the rig uh, to, to do stop work. <clears throat> so another one, the uh, failure of BP's well site leaders and the Transocean Deepwater Horizon rig crew to recognize the risk associated with multiple problems that occurred between April 19th and 20th was a possible contributing cause to the incident. Again. There was multiple issues uh, with the, uh, the shoe track uh, cement and the failure that eventually occurred. Uh, none of those uh, particular incidents or anomalies that occurred uh, while doing the cement job were recognized at a, as a risk. Uh, if they had, again, that would have been another opportunity to stop the work. So another conclusion, uh, Deepwater Horizon crew's inability to accurately monitor pit levels while conducting simultaneous operations during the critical negative test was a contributing cause of the kick detection failure. So again, here it was documented uh, that they were actually taking returns back to, uh, to multiple pits at the time uh, instead of one pit. Uh, the mud logger even testified that they were moving a lot of mud from, from different pits, reserve pits, active pits. Uh, again, another opportunity for stop work that someone could have could have stopped the work at that time. This one, the failure of Deepwater Horizon crew, including BP Transocean and Sperry Sun personnel uh, to detect the influx of the hydrocarbons until hydrocarbons were above the BOP stack uh, was a cause of the well control failure. So if you go through some of the timeline here at 858, uh, flow out increased significantly and the pit level rose by approximately 100 barrels in 15 minutes. Uh, during this time or, or shortly after, the mud logger went uh, on a five to eight minute uh, smoke break in the coffee shop. Uh, at 9, 10, having observed none of these, uh, these indicators uh, that, that the kick was in progress, the crew actually started rerouting uh, returns overboard and eliminated uh, the possibility of, of mud logger uh, monitoring. At 9.42, the crew detected flow and diverted the gas influx from the well to the mud gas separator in accordance with Transocean's policies. Shortly thereafter, the rig crew activated the upper annular preventers and the upper variable bore ram after mud ejected from the well and was already on the rig floor. So here, after ignoring the pressure on the, on the drill pipe, the Deepwater Horizon crew, their hesitance to shut in the BOP immediately was a possible contributing cause of the well control failure again. Uh, another opportunity for stop work. This one is, is somewhat interesting. I think actually plays a part in it. You may not think uh, of it naturally, but the overall complacency of, of the Deepwater Horizon crew was possible contributing cause uh, of the kick detection failure. At this particular point in the well, they had drilled it. They had cemented the, uh, the production case and they were doing a negative pressure test. Uh, there was actually testimony by several, it says, once you get to that point, everybody goes to the mindset that we're done, the job is through, and, and we have no more risks. Uh, so apparently that complacency sets in. They may have done this several times, uh, but the complacency set in. So this conclusion, the failure of personnel on Deepwater Horizon Bridge, monitoring the gas alarms to notify the Deepwater Horizon crew 
in the engine control room about alarms so that they could take actions to shut down the engines was a contributing cause of the response failure. So uh, there were gas alarms that were uh, received uh, by at least the uh, dynamic positioning officer uh, that was uh, uh, on station at the time. Uh, there was no notification to the engine room of the gas release and, and what should take place. So another conclusion, the rigs, uh, the failure to initiate the emergency disconnect system uh, until after hydrocarbons had risen above the BOP stack was a possible contributing cause of the response failure. So there was no evidence uh, that the transocean driller made any attempts to initiate the emergency disconnect uh, system. Uh, subsea engineer, in fact, attempted to activate the emergency disconnect system sometime after the explosion had disabled communications with the BOP stack. Okay, I'd like to go back to, to this again, the, the bow tie diagram of, of uh, hazards and the barriers and mitigation. Uh, so now shifting from the, those findings, uh, this was something I find, found myself using quite a bit uh, to explain to various people as far as uh, what actions need to be taken going forward. Uh, I think it's very important uh, that we look at those barriers both on the prevention and the mitigation side, and that's what I'll spend time now uh, looking at. So on, on prevention, uh, we strongly believe that there was a need to improve the well control regulations that we had in place. Uh, of course, most of that come, came from this Deepwater Horizon tragedy. There were other uh, well control incidents that we had had that also uh, pointed to some of these issues. There were many revised and new uh, industry standards that, uh, that we had not officially incorporated into our regulations. Uh, we took the opportunity to do that and the codification of decades of, of BSEE policies to put those into regulations. So the development process, again, uh, after the Horizon incident, uh, BSEE issued the drilling safety rule, which I'll go into a little bit. Uh, on August 2012, API finished their work on Standard 53 in November of 2012. We, we uh, publicized the proposed well control rule April of 2015 uh, rece received many comments on that rule. The final well control rule was published April 29th of 2016, and the well control rule became effective July 28th, 2016. However, many requirements in the rule are staged over a number of years, uh, depending on the requirement. So the drilling safety rule was, was really broken up into two parts. Uh, one was around the well bore integrity, the other was around well control equipment and procedures. Uh, so here on, on the well bore integrity, uh, incorporating API 65, uh, RP65 part two, we hadn't done that before on best cementing practices, required certification from professional engineers uh, that the casing and cement program was fit for purpose, uh, requiring two independent tested barriers across each flow path uh, during completion with, a, again, an engineering certification. Proper installation and sealing and locking of casing and liner. Uh, BSEE approval before displacing fluids for the uh, negative pressure test. Enhanced deep water well control training as well. So on the well control equipment and procedures for the drilling safety rule, uh, we stepped up uh, our review of documentation and, and schematics uh, for all the BOP control systems. Uh, we did find numerous uh, issues with that, that they weren't keeping up accurate uh, schematics even of the BOP system, which was an issue during the Deepwater Horizon, we found as well. Independent third-party verification that the blind shear rams would cut uh, the drill pipe at maximum anticipated surface pressure. Subsea BOP equipped with ROV intervention. Again, many of these things were in place, but we did not have them specifically in our regulations. Uh, maintaining ROV with a train crew on floating rigs at all time. Again, that was pretty much done all the time. Uh, auto shear, dead man on all DP rigs. Again, that was pretty much in place, but not in our regulations. Documentation of subsea BOP inspection and maintenance per RP53. Again, that was incorporated, uh, the latest version at that time. Uh, ROV intervention testing on subsea BOP stump tests. So we were requiring that that ROV actually be tested on the stump test with the BOP stack. Uh, function test of auto shear and dead man 
during the subsea uh, BOP stump test as well. And then a dead man test uh, during the initial seafloor uh, test as well. So uh, much of that focused again around the, the BOP system itself. The well control rule, uh, which went effective again July 28th, 2016. Again, a lot of incorporation of, of newer industry standards at that time. Uh, additional performance criteria for blowout preventers, uh, criteria for maintenance and repair of BOP equipment, uh, safe drilling practice and procedures. I realize these are all very high level, but probably not enough time to go into each one of these. Uh, there was a requirement or is a requirement for real-time monitoring that has not gone into a effect yet. That's one of those that, that's uh, further down the road. Uh, formal third-party certification program, that's another one that's, that's uh, is to be implemented a little bit later. And some specifications around, around downhole equipment. So I mentioned those effective dates and you may not be able to, to read this. Uh, but it does uh, take some of the implementation out as far as 2023 uh, with, with some of the requirements. Some of the things I'll mention that, that have not gone into place, uh, again, is a BESI, what we call a BESI approved verification uh, organization to verify BOPs. Uh, one that's coming up in 2018 is the sharing of tubing uh, with external control lines. Uh, again, I mentioned the real-time monitoring. Uh, there's other requirements for dedicated uh, accumulator capacity for dead man and auto shear, uh, and the requirement for, for dual shear rams uh, on each rig. Now what I'd like to do is, is shift a little bit away from the prevention. Those were the, the steps that we, we took, mainly uh, regulatory uh, for prevention. I should mention that I don't have a slide or didn't have a slide in there uh, that was also probably pretty critical was the implementation uh, of a mandatory safety environmental management system uh, because that has taken us somewhat in a different direction is how we look at things, especially when you look at all, all those things I pointed out as stop work authority and management systems uh, that could potentially uh, prevent. We did go out with a reg regulation making that, uh, that mandatory after the incident. Uh, but on mitigation and lessons learned on the response, I'm gonna focus my attention on source control uh, and that was our main res uh, responsibility in the Unified Command with, with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, we looked at, at source control. Coast Guard had the lead role on the surface response efforts, so skimming, burning, uh, and booming of, of oil was their responsibility. Uh, and then again, when prevention efforts fail, uh, mitigation of the release must occur through the proper source control and the planning for that. This just walks through some of the steps after the incident that occurred. So after the blowout, immediately following that uh, was ROV intervention on the BOP stack. We were witnessing that uh, real time with a real time feed as far as the attempts with the ROV to intervene on the, on the stack. And again, that was obviously uh, was a failed attempt to, to actuate the BOPs at that point. Uh, later then the horizon rig itself sinks the hydrocarbon flows were actually coming from two locations, subsea, one from the drill pipe and the riser, uh, which were still uh, attached to the BOP stack. Uh, there was planning and execution of two relief wells uh, on the Macondo uh, blowout. Uh, capping valve was then placed on the drill pipe, which, which stopped the flow uh, coming out of the drill pipe, but did not stop the flow coming out of the, uh, the riser itself. Uh, coffer dam was attempted uh, to capture and, and route back to the surface. That coffer dam failed uh, due to uh, hydrates forming in that coffer dam. Uh, there was a riser insertion tool that was uh, utilized and it was partially successful in, in capturing some of the oil and routing it back to surface vessels for collection. There was a top kill attempted. This is sometimes referred to as the, uh, the junk shot. Uh, there was a top hat, what we call a top hat, it was a temporary uh, installation of a system to contain and route uh, the flow back to production vessels. Uh, eventually then the containment cap, which pretty much everyone is familiar with now, was installed to stop the flow. Uh, then the static kill attempt at that point uh, was successful. And then finally the cement uh, permanently sealed the well. Uh, so again, this is, this is just showing uh, those attempts at the riser insertion tool. Again, the, these were tools that are made up on the, on the fly. None of these tools existed. This was uh, 
as other things were going on, relief wells and other planning for these other things, uh, these were maybe some of the more simple things that, that could be done uh, relatively quickly. And again, it was, it was partially uh, successful in, in capturing oil. Uh, again, this is the, uh, the top kill that was attempted. Uh, it can be thought of as, as a dynamic kill, but at, at the BOP stack itself, uh, which was understood to be a real long shot to be able to do that. Uh, as I mentioned before, it was often referred to as a junk shot. So plugging material was injected at the, at the same time in attempt to plug off uh, the well at the BOP stack and then be able to, uh, to pump in to kill the well. Uh, and again, as most people realize, that attempt was unsuccessful. So this is a, a, a diagram or a drawing of, uh, the, of the top hat. Again, it's a loose fitting. It's not a positive seal uh, on top of the BOP stack, uh, but it was a means of temporary capturing uh, the oil, and it was flowed back uh, to a vessel at the surface. Again, the capping stack, which most people may be very familiar with now, uh, but the important thing to realize is even when that stack was, was placed on, uh, on the well, uh, there was extensive discussion and analysis, analysis as to whether or not the condition of the well bore itself uh, could handle a shut-in pressure because uh, you had full uh, produced volume of, of uh, the fluid gradient of the, of the production uh, throughout the well bore. And so the, the shut-in pressure and the condition of the well was, was of concern. And that had to be monitored even after it was shut in. There was actually differences of opinion as to whether it should stay shut in or it should be opened back up again uh, for concern over a broach, uh, broach condition. So following uh, the response, uh, there were numerous public forums that were held uh, to address various aspects of containment. We did issue what we call a notice to lessees, which spelled out uh, what we believe was required for containment. Uh, prior containment regulations really addressed surface uh, containment, not subsea containment. We worked very closely with industry and the containment organizations that eventually met the needs uh, of industry uh, to allow them to go back to drilling after the mor moratoria was put in place. This is one of the earlier uh, capping stacks uh, from Marine Well Containment Corporation uh, that was developed and covered uh, part of the industry uh, other parts of the industry went with a group called Helix Well Containment Group, or HWCG, um, and covered the same needs. We evaluated these systems uh, and accepted these systems. Uh, these things, these systems of various sorts, obviously now are, are worldwide uh, located. Uh, I believe there's some here in Stavanger, some in uh, Aberdeen, Africa, Brazil. Uh, they're in most geographic locations around the world. Um, what we have done with this, though, we didn't stop there. We went ahead and do, did drills with actual deployment tests of these systems. So they were run uh, on an inactive uh, wellhead subsea. We actually did a drill. We told them they knew it was coming. We told them when to start. So deployment all the way from shore, all the way out uh, with installation on that, uh, on that wellhead and going through the shut-in procedures uh, was done. Uh, all of that was done in both cases, less than 10 days. I think uh, or really more close to five or six days to actually accomplish that from all the way from shore, uh, offshore and installed. Also, what we did is we worked with industry on a well containment screening tool. Uh, again, we thought this was important on those final stages of Maconda when, we, when the capping stack was put on, uh, this idea of, of the, uh, trying to determine the well bore integrity uh, so there, there was actually a, uh, a calculation program uh, that was developed uh, that runs through the, each well design that we approve now runs through this program. Uh, and it basically determines based on that design whether the well can be shut in with full well bore integrity uh, is the first one. The other is if there, there may be a deep failure somewhere in the system. Uh, it may be a liner lap, something like that, but it's a deep, deep failure, basically an underground flow. Uh, but then we go into the additional analysis of whether or not that could actually broach the surface. Uh, so that's another category. The final one would be uh, that you don't have mechanical integrity, uh, so you do have an underground flow, and that flow could actually make it, uh, make it to the seafloor. Uh, I can say that uh, we do not permit wells under that, that last uh, category. Uh, 
and most wells to date. Uh, there were some right after Macondo that fell into the that middle category, uh, but today most wells are are designed with the ability to be shut in with full well bore integrity. Uh, I know you can't uh, really read that, but this just demonstrates the 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 uh, flow process through the the uh, that tool that I was saying, the well containment screening tool, and so all the decision points throughout that that tool. So again, we worked uh, very closely with industry to to develop this tool, and and we run all our our well permits uh, through that at this time. This is just a quick uh, screen snapshot that shows you all all the different points in the well that uh, that are analyzed, and whether they pass or fail. Uh, and this is an indication in this particular one that. Uh, of, uh, of passing the criteria. So lessons learned, a summary of that uh, for mitigation. Uh, we believe that you have to have the capping stack and flowback capability and all the support equipment to deploy that. Uh, it must be analyzed on a well-by-well -well basis uh, for both pressure and flow rate uh, capacity. Uh, operator must have the capability to prepare the well or the BOP uh, stack to receive a capping stack. This means you must have uh, things like de uh, debris removal equipment, shears, uh, subsea saws uh, that must be available and be deployed because realizing that that has to be done before you can get a, a cap on, on the well or the BOP stack. Uh, you also must have a temporary flowback plan uh, that may be used prior to getting the, uh, the capping stack on. One such thing is what you saw with the, the uh, top hat, but we don't we don't necessarily specify what that needs to be. Again, proper hazard analysis is critical uh, to a safe and successful containment effort, so that hazard analysis really needs to, to be done uh, to assess that effort. Uh, simultaneous operation planning is also critical to completing containment. I think you saw one of those pictures before with all those vessels uh, on location. Each and every one of those was dynamically positioned in 5,000 feet of water, working close proximity. Uh, so there was a lot of operations going on at the same time. Uh, we require that equipment to deploy subsea dispersant is necessary uh, to protect the safety workers at the surface uh, that are conducting uh, direct vertical access work or other support uh, vessels in that area. It's important to note that we as an agency do not approve uh, the actual use of the dispersant. Uh, our Environmental Protection Agency has that call, not us, but we can require that operators have the ability to uh, deploy the subsea dispersant. So looking forward, uh, what we're doing and continue to do is, is work with operators. We conduct drills, um, what we call incident command structure and responsibilities. Uh, we ensure that the decision makers are clearly identified within the uh, individual responsible party and the federal government and ensure that they have the proper uh, technical background, not swayed by uh, outside influences are fully supported all the way up the chain on, on both sides. Uh, and that really makes for an effective response. Just have a couple other things that I wanted to leave you with. Uh, one uh, here is, is a, a thought uh, that we were really looking at uh, related to this incident that, uh, again, I mentioned BP uh, and Transocean, for that matter, had a lot of success in, in drilling uh, deep water wells in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they, they really didn't have a tremendous amount of problems, uh, but there is that thought process that success breeds complacency and complacency breeds failure. Uh, so the difference between success and failure, we think, uh, is not always that far apart uh, due to potential complacency. Uh, and so this is an area where I, th I think uh, we need to look harder as a regulator and strive to focus on, on the hazards and mitigating the risk associated with those hazards and, and never stop uh, looking at that and don't get caught up in, in past successes. would want to mention that there are over 50 best employees that were involved or directly involved with the response and source control uh, efforts on, the, on this incident. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that they did uh, during, during this, this incident. It was very taxing on everyone. Uh, but I think there, again, there was many learnings from this. I think our staff is much more prepared uh, at, at this point uh, on prevention and mitigation uh, of the consequences. And I'll leave you with this. This is as the Macondo well sits 
uh, today in 5,000 feet of water. This is the cap that's on the well. Uh, I should mention that uh, I have my colleague with me here today, Fred Brink. Uh, and so if you have any tough questions, we can turn those over to Fred. Uh, but he has been responsible for, for implementing and verifying the implementation of many of the new, new regulations and, and requirements that we have today. Thank you very much. Well, it's up to you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, thanks for a good uh, presentation here. My name is uh, Richard Stephens. I'm working for NOV um, in Norway, National mm -hmm. Oil Varco. Um, we've uh, just started up with IWCF uh, uh, tr certification. Uh, trading for well control and um, working with that what we see is that uh, it's a pretty big topic to uh, to cover uh, I think I counted like uh, 300 uh, topics approximately to go through in uh, in one week mm -hmm. and um, uh, as you know uh, senior drilling personnel has to um, have this test every second year mm -hmm. uh, to be certified for, for drilling in the US it's more IADC mm -hmm. uh, certification but uh, that one week to cover 300 uh, topics, uh, when you think of it, it's the last day's uh, exam. Uh, Thursday is uh, uh, working with the simulator and uh, doing practical exercises. Wednesday is equipment. The two first days is PMP, uh, procedures and practices. And uh, what we see is that uh, that can be pretty tough to get through all those uh, topics and actually fully understand what's going on and what can go on. And that brings me also to the, to the next uh, uh, topic, which is uh, kick detection systems. It's very easy to explain things that's happening. And you think, oh, no, that's just, as you said, the bladder effect. This is, no, it doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't, uh, we don't care about that. We can just proceed. But actually to understand, to detect the situation is, is really a key issue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, my, my, my question is, would you consider to, to look into better kick detection systems and to maybe look at the training structure and to see if uh, you, know, you really learn something more out of that course. So, uh, two very good questions then. Uh, so on, on the training, I, I probably couldn't agree with you more over the years that I've been involved I, and, and when I've taken well control training, uh, I may be able to pass it, but you wouldn't want me on a rig uh, doing well control operations. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen the industry try to make moves, uh, which I think are in, in the right uh, direction. Uh, a lot of virtual, virtual training, uh, condition-based training, uh, crew resource management training, bringing the whole crew in, working it uh, together. Uh, I think there's been strides made there. I'm not sure we're there yet, but it's, you know, it goes back to how do you ensure competency versus uh, taking a test and saying you passed a test. Uh, Again, you know, our thoughts after this is that uh, many, many drillers, for example, may be very fortunate in their careers and, and, and face uh, very few actual serious well control incidents. Uh, and so again, you know, it could be that complacency thing that comes in is that uh, I've done this many, many times. I've never had a problem, especially with your, you know, if you're 21 days on and off with that, your, your day crew, night crew, uh, you know, chances are, you know, you may not see something for a long period of time in your career. That's a concern. So the training is one I think we, we still need to work on. I know IADC is working heavily on that. Again, I've seen the, cre uh, the crew uh, resource management uh, being addressed a lot more these days. On the, uh, the kick detection, I think that's still one that, uh, that needs to be worked more. I know there's uh, certain things we're working even on the managed pressure drilling that uh, can even improve, you know, the, the, the kick and the handling of kicks and, and awareness of kicks. So uh, we're still looking through things like that. The real-time monitoring uh, that, that we've seen, uh, and of course BP uh, had to implement that immediately afterwards uh, as far as a stepped-up uh, real-time monitoring. Uh, we've seen their systems there where they're in there. It's not just anyone sitting behind that desk in that real-time monitoring center. It is, uh, it is mud loggers that have worked out there. So 
there's a lot of debate about real-time monitoring centers, what it needs to be, what it doesn't need to be, where does it need to be. Uh, but obviously, uh, you know, a second set of eyes uh, probably never hurts. Uh, I think you got to be careful with trying to take responsibility away from the crew uh, on the rig. But uh, I, I think a second set of eyes is, is valuable. And again, we're looking at that. Again, we have a lot of questions about our rule on real-time monitoring, uh, and we'll be trying to work through that to, to implement the best system that, uh, that addresses that. Hi, uh, my name is Stefan Christiansen. I work with Startoil, and uh, I'll be presenting a little bit later on. Uh, thank you for a very good presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say I've watched the video as well that is put out on the internet many times, and within Startoil we have been uh, presenting this case to our very best uh, ability many times, both to new graduates and to more uh, experienced uh, people. Yeah, I have a question regarding the um, the diverter system that you mentioned uh, that was diverting the flow to the pore body gasser, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the pore body gasser normally we use to take flow over a choke up uh, up uh, the the choke line from the uh, successfully closed BOP. In this case, if I'm not mistaken hydrocarbons came above the BOP and the diverter system was closed and then flow came to the pore body gasser which would then, if what I'm saying now is correct, obviously not be able to handle the amount of hydrocarbons coming into it and release it in the middle of the rig. So I'm wondering, could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, what are you leaving the correct lineup to the contractors, is there anything, any any mitigating actions coming with regards to this? Uh, I can answer that partially. I was not on the investigation team, so I don't recall if there was a specific conclusion around that. But obviously, uh, it's exactly what you what you said that uh, that once uh, the flow uh, gets above, especially gas gets above the B subsea BOP stack. Uh, the mud gas separation equipment is not designed for that. The expansion of the gas uh, will overcome it very, very rapidly. Uh, and obviously, the the diverter system is de is designed or, or best designed for that. I'm not saying it will not fail either with the amount of gas expansion if you don't shut in the, the subsea stack. Uh, but that was a great concern. I remember going out after the incident and and talking to rig crews and, and drillers and just posing that question as far as what, what are your procedures if gas enters the riser. Um, some of them looked at me at disgust, which I think meant that they, they got the right answer. I think this may have been a Transocean uh, crew member and a rig, and, and again, the answer was you know, divert overboard. Uh, again, I don't know, uh, I didn't do the investigation myself, but I don't know if that was a point uh, where they went back and looked at those procedures within Transocean uh, to verify that. I don't think that uh, obviously was the, the correct uh, correct procedures. It seems like if, it, if they did have it in there, they've corrected that now. Um, but that, that was of, of great concern because I thought that was something that was trained and, and learned on years and years ago. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, Totelage. Uh, I was working a lot with Macondo at the time it happened because we, the company I was working for at the time, were involved in a lot of deep water uh, drilling planning. I also participated in the first IRF meeting in Vancouver that happened uh, the year after. Uh, I can recall that <coughs> one of the conclusions at the time already was that. If people have been doing what they were supposed to be doing according to company standards, company procedures, and as you recall uh, during your presentation, which was very good, you pinpointed a lot of things that was sort of human uh, issues. I mean, human-related. Re people were not doing what they're supposed to do. 
And another uh, conclusion in the RF meeting was that the, the culture of stop working authority wasn't a part of the culture in, in the US Gulf of Mexico at the time. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, uh, I'm, you know, a lot of the, what you've been presenting afterwards is being sort of mitigation action is, mm -hmm. is related to other things like improving standards and stuff like that. But, but how do you actually ensure or, or, or in main, main, as a regulator that mm -hmm. a stop working authority is being implemented these days? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good subject. It's one which, which IRF has debated ever, ever since that, uh, that forum. As a matter of fact, we, we discussed it again this week. Uh, it, it's, it's sometimes often to, difficult to find that exact measure to know when you have the culture where it needs, needs to be. Uh, you know, we're continuing to work on that. I, I think our step in the, in the U.S., as far as uh, really realizing the safety management systems, need to be a part of our regulations and implemented where we can start auditing against that as opposed to us doing compliance checks on, on equipment and verifying the equipment is working. Uh, you know, a lot of this equipment, I can't guarantee for sure that it all, all would have worked, uh, but there was a, a, a very large human element, uh, obviously, to this incident. Uh, you know, that Swiss cheese model where, where there were a lot of holes and a lot of them lined up uh, on this. And, but many steps could have been taken by individuals to prevent it uh, at, at various steps in that process. So it's one we're still working with. I, I think the uh, safety management system in the U.S. is one. We, we may not be as far along as some other regulators, including PSA, uh, on that. Uh, but it's one we are starting to do, uh, do audits again uh, against. We're looking at, uh, at how we conduct those audits to try to get that sense of safety culture uh, in, in place, and we're, we're continuing to work that. We're not seeing, I should mention that uh, right now, those audits uh, are primarily conducted by third party, uh, independent third party auditors in, in the US. Uh, we're still evaluating that. I think there's mixed feelings about that, whether those auditors are really catching what they need to catch versus what our inspectors may be seeing in the field, and those two don't align. Uh, and then we can conduct those audits our, ourselves, and that's where our plan is to do. We've still got time for one more question, if anyone. No? Well, Lars has um, said he'll sit with us uh, for the rest of the seminar, although we're uh, now going to switch to Norwegian language. <laughs> um, and he'll also be sticking around here afterwards. Uh, I guess um, some of you still have some questions or issues you want to discuss with Lars, and there's opportunity for that after the seminar is, uh, is over. Thank you. So thank you, Lars. Thank you.